So it is my pleasure to introduce our last speaker, Dr. Justin Devanzo. Dr. Devanzo received his medical degree from Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia. He then completed his residency as well as a fellowship in neurocritical care and functional neurosurgery at Penn State Health Hershey Medical Center in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Dr. Justin Devanzo is an expert neurosurgeon experienced in neurocritical care, neurotrauma, and the new newest therapies for pain management. His experience in implanting spinal cord stimulators, dor dorsal root ganglion stimulators, as well as peripheral nerve stimulators. Please welcome Dr. Devanzo. Today he will be talking about neuromodulation and pain. The, as Ben mentioned, this lecture has been pre-recorded, and so there will not be a live Q&A portion to, to his talk. Even so, please feel free to email Dr. Devanzo directly with any questions you may have. He provides his email address at the end of his lecture. I'll let Ben share his screen now. Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry I can't be there in person. My name is Justin Devanzo. I'm one of the neurosurgeons here at AHN. Uh, I want to thank you for having me today to, to give this talk. I'm looking forward to it. I was asked to talk about neuromodulation and its role in the treatment of pain. Uh, we will focus mostly on chronic pain because that is where the bulk of this is done, but there are a lot of horizons in the future that you know, stimulation and neuromodulation will hopefully bridge over time, but we'll get a good basis going today. I don't have any disclosures other than I will discuss a little bit about different companies' products throughout the talk, uh, but no disclosures to, to discuss. So we're going to talk a little bit about the history of spinal cord stimulation, the proposed mechanism of stimulation, the indications for this, the types of stimulation available, uh, the procedure for stimulation, some other types of stim that we do, and I'm going to go through some case examples because I think that's the best way to kind of illustrate what we do and what we're trying to accomplish with this procedure. So spinal cord stimulation was first used to treat chronic pain in 1967 by Sheely and Mortimer. This was a direct intradural stimulation of the dorsal column. So intradural surgery where we opened up the dura and placed the leads directly on the spinal cord. <clears throat> in 1971, Shinogi first reported the analgesic effects of epidural spinal cord stimulation, which is what we do now is we place the leads in the epidural space. Spinal cord stimulation therapy entered routine use in the 1980s. It was approved by the FDA in 1989 for the use uh, for the treatment of chronic pain in the setting of nerve damage. This now accounts for about 70% of neuromodulation cases. So it's a huge chunk of the cases we're doing that involve some sort of stimulation. How does this work? So really what we're talking about here is gate control theory. Uh, that was the initial mechanism that was proposed as what we, how we thought this worked. So non-painful input closes the gates to painful input. And this was proposed in 1965 by Mel Zach and Wall. And this is based on the interplay of nociceptive and non-nociceptive fibers at the dorsal column. Small diameter fibers are the pain transmitting fibers and large diameter fibers transmit touch, pressure, and vibration. And if you look at this diagram on the right side of the screen here, uh, the closed gate is where you have these large diameter sensory fibers as the more active fiber. So that's going to the transmission cells, which are going to the rest to transmit this information to the sensory cortex in the brain. And if you notice also, there's a neuron in between these two fibers, and that's an inhibitory inner neuron. So not only are we stimulating the transmission cells with something that's not a painful stimuli, but we're also positively stimulating the inhibitory inner neurons, inhibiting that other effect of the painful fibers. You can also see that when we stimulate the small diameter sensory fibers or the pain transmitting fibers, 
the pain signals are being transmitted through the transmission cells to the sensory cortex. In addition, they are inhibiting the inhibitory interneurons. So they're stopping that inhibition of the transmission cells. So a little bit of a vicious cycle here. So the thought process here was providing some sort of stimulation that didn't involve pain was going to be beneficial to shutting off those pain signals as they got to the dorsal column. There are some other proposed mechanisms. One of those is in neuropathic pain. Uh, this is thought to alter the local neurochemistry in the dorsal horn by suppressing the hyperexcitability of the neurons in the dorsal horn, leading to an increase in GABA and an increase in serotonin. A possible suppression of glutamate and aspartate are also uh, thought to occur. Ischemic pain is thought to also have a different mechanism by which spinal cord stimulation may be of benefit. This leads to restoration of the oxygen demand supply, possibly due to inhibition of the sympathetic system, possibly due to vasodilation. It's not very clear exactly how this works, but there is thought to be a little bit of a different mechanism that may be beneficial here. What are some indications for spinal cord stimulation? Far away, the most common indication that we use this for is post-laminectomy syndrome. Also seen is failed back surgery syndrome. These are people who've had spine surgery in the past, oftentimes either a decompression or a decompression combined with a fusion. Sure. They've now been worked up for this pain that they've been continuing to have. And there's not thought to be any structural or compressive pathology that can be corrected with a traditional spine surgery. That leads us down the path of spinal cord stimulation. Another very common reason is chronic regional pain syndrome. Uh, you may have heard this as uh, RSD, causalgia, or some other names for this. These are classic kind of nerve damage uh, syndromes, and these people classically respond to spinal cord stimulation as well. Chronic radiculopathy is another diagnosis that we see in folks with responding to spinal cord stimulation. That could be both of the upper or the lower extremity. And then some less common diagnoses that we see or indications for STEM include chronic angina, phantom limb pain, ischemic limb pain, pain secondary to some sort of nerve damage. This doesn't really fall into the CRPS category. These are the most common indications we see for spinal cord STEM. So what's the preoperative workup look like? What do we start with and you know, how do we get these people to implantation? Thoracic and lumbar MRIs are used to rule out structural pathology and also to rule out any kind of stenosis, which would preclude placement of an epidural lead. Another important part is neuropsychological testing. Some studies have found that depression, anxiety, somatiz somatization, and hyperchondriasis can lead uh, to poor outcomes with spinal cord stem. So they go through a battery of testing to make sure that none of these situations are very profound and, and you know, contributing to their pain syndrome. Ultimately, they then proceed to get a stimulation trial, which we'll talk about a little bit in more detail in a few slides. And they get greater than 50% reduction in their pain symptoms with that trial. So what does the procedure itself look like? When we talk about implantation of spinal cord stimulator devices, there are two types of leads which we use for stimulation. One is a percutaneous lead and the other is a paddle lead. For trials, percutaneous leads are used almost exclusively. We can accomplish this through very small incisions in a, in a needle to access the epidural space and place a small wire in the midline, in the dorsal aspect of the spinal canal to hook that up to an external generator and they can do that for about five to seven days and ultimately determine if this is a technology that will benefit them with regards to the treatment of their pain. For the permanent implant, we use both paddle and percutaneous leads in different situations, depending on what we're trying to accomplish. For paddle lead placement, this involves the creation of a laminotomy. You may have heard laminectomy as a term in the past. A laminotomy is a 
removal of a portion of the lamina, but not the entire lamina. We basically remove the inferior aspect of the lamina bilaterally, and we define the epidural space. We then place the lead in the midline of the dorsal epidural space, and we use x-ray in the operating room to guide us with this. We then place the pulse generator in the flank region on either side. We tunnel the leads under the skin and connect everything together. This is really an outpatient surgery and people can go home the same day or the next day, depending on how they're doing. And ultimately we are able to turn the device on right after surgery at a low setting. And then we start to modify those settings at their two week follow-up appointment. This is what a system looks like. You can see the lead is in the midline <clears throat> in the spinal canal, and then the battery is in the flank region, basically somewhere between where you sit down and where you wear your pant line, somewhere to keep it comfortable and not too obtrusive to the patient. What type of lead do we use? So these are really the, the leads on the market right now. Um, these are from three different companies, and I'll spare you whose is which, but you can see the three on the left side of the screen and the one at the bottom, those are called paddle leads. Bigger leads require a bigger opening and ultimately the laminotomy, like we talked about. Those small silver squares on each of the leads are the contacts, and that's where the stimulation occurs. The lead on the right side of the screen is a percutaneous lead. It, you can see it's very thin, looks like a piece of spaghetti, and those, again, silver pieces are the contacts that are used to stimulate the spinal cord. What about types of stimulation? So what do we do once this is implanted? What does the patient experience? So the first is tonic stimulation. This is the oldest type of stimulation uh, that we've had for basically since stimulation was brought to the forefront in the 70s and 80s. You can see that the frequency of this is 10 to 150 hertz with a pulse width of 10 to 500 microseconds. And then the amplitude is somewhere between 0.1 and 25 milliamps, depending on the patient's sensitivity. Some newer types of stimulation include burst, high frequency stimulation, and DTM. Burst is a type of stimulation where, as you can see the pattern below, it's a higher frequency stim that's occurring more frequently with on and off periods. And you can see the frequencies there for intraburst and interburst. The pulse width is the same. And then the amplitude depends on sensitivity testing that's done after implantation. High frequency stim is at even a higher frequency than burst with a similar pulse width and then a similar amplitude as to burst stimulation. The big benefit to burst and high frequency stimulation has been that we've gotten better coverage of back pain with these as opposed to what we would get with tonic stimulation. Tonic stimulation worked very well for radiculopathy, but it was not as successful in treating back pain. Burst and high frequency stim are much more successful in those fields. DTM is a proprietary type of stimulation that is currently give, uh, offered by Medtronic. Uh, it's also effective in treating back pain in addition to leg pain. However, their focus is more on back pain with this type of stimulation. There's not a lot of information available about the stimulation patterns, but there is a lot of talk in their research about changing the biology of the spinal cord, much like we talked about earlier with regards to one of the proposed mechanisms of stimulation. What are some other stimulation options? Well, this what we've been talking about is really thoracic spinal cord stimulation. So stimulating near the region of T8, T9 to get control of low back pain and lower extremity pain. Cervical spinal cord stimulation is another option to treat neck pain and upper extremity symptoms. Dorsal root ganglion stimulation, which I'll talk about further, is more direct stimulation to a exiting nerve root in an effort to try to get more controlled pain in a very specific region. And peripheral nerve stimulation involves treating a nerve directly with stimulation as opposed to the spinal cord. Dorsal root ganglion stimulation became available in the mid 2010s. And this involves stimulation of the DRG as opposed to traditional dorsal column stimulation. 
this more focused stimulation is available to target more focused areas of pain. And this is successful in areas typically not well covered by traditional spinal cord stimulation, mainly the chest region, abdomen, groin pain, uh, knee pain. Some really successful situations are post hernia pain, um, difficult thoracic radiculopathies, uh, chronic abdominal pain. These are some things that we've treated very effectively with DRG that we weren't treating quite as effectively with traditional stim. This is some examples of DRG stim. The cartoon on the left of the screen shows the needle accessing the epidural space and then the wire going out along the dorsal root ganglion out of the foramen at the particular level being stimulated. And then on the right side of the screen is an X-ray showing those leads again, going out the, the foramen, uh, stimulating directly on the dorsal root ganglion. And you can see some of the loops of wire that are used to hold these in place. Those create strain relief, which ultimately allow the wires to remain in position. Peripheral nerve stimulation was introduced in the 1960s, even before spinal cord stimulation came to light. And this was targeting the peripheral nerve itself as opposed to the spinal cord. You can really use this to target any peripheral nerve, but we commonly use these for occipital nerve, uh, for occipital neuralgia, trigeminal nerve, for resistant uh, trigeminal neuralgia. Sciatic nerve is a nerve that can be targeted for people with amputees with neuro painful neuromas. And the saphenous nerve is a good nerve to target for post knee pain after knee replacements or knee surgery. Again, some cartoon and real life examples here. The cartoon example at the top shows the position of the wire. This was for uh, shoulder pain. And then the picture at the bottom is a picture of one of the leads available to perform peripheral nerve stimulation. This is often done without an implanted pulse generator. So the wire goes under the skin, the wire has a receiver, and then transcutaneously, the pulse generator is used to stimulate the nerve. So oftentimes the patients have to wear a sticker over the end of the receiver, and then the pulse generator connects to that sticker and emits the stimulation. Some other options for treatment of chronic pain, intrathecal pumps for the delivery of medication are a reasonable option in certain situations, but they've fallen by the wayside more recently, especially as stimulation has improved significantly. Deep brain stimulation is something that's being studied further for the treatment of chronic pain, but is not really ready for prime time quite yet. Motor cortex stimulation and cingulotomies have been around for a period of time now, but again, have not really reached the level of becoming something that's being done with any level of frequency. They're more rare cases in situations where many other therapies have failed. So I thought I would run through some cases. These are all cases that I've done um, and experienced, and I think they show a good variety of the things we can do with neuromodulation for chronic pain. The first case is a man who presents after a failed epidural access for percutaneous stimulation trial. They were unable to pass the lead past the T12 level. The uh, pain management doctor performed this trial and was unable to, to accomplish this. He had a previous L3 to 4 laminectomy, which was complicated by osteomyelitis and discitis. He continued to have bilateral back and lower extremity pain, which affected his daily activities. He had undergone multiple epidural steroid injections, facet injections, and trigger point injections with no real relief of his symptoms. So we got an MRI of the thoracic spine to ensure that there was nothing that would be impeding us from putting in this lead. And he seemed to have plenty of room to tolerate this. So he took him to the operating room and we placed a paddle lead that you can see here on the right. And he tolerated this very well. We did this as an open trial, meaning that we put this lead in and we tunneled it out of the skin and had it hooked up to an external generator for about a week. He was very happy with the pain relief he got and we ended up implanting his pulse generator a week later. He's doing very well and has had about 70 to 75% relief of his pain. Case number two is a patient who presented after a successful spinal cord stimulator trial with greater than 80% relief. 
He had a history of L4 to 5 laminectomy with good resolution of his leg pain symptoms for some time. He now had recurrence of his leg and back pain with the leg being worse than the back and the right side being worse than the left. This was his MRI, which shows significant stenosis with some spondylolisthesis, meaning slip of the bones at L4-5 and significant stenosis at L3-4. I discussed this with him with regards to undergoing a redo decompression at this level. He was not really interested in having any further structural spine surgery, but was very happy with the results he got from the stimulator. So we ended up placing a paddle lead and he did very well with this. He got about 60 to 70% relief and he was very happy with the amount of relief that he received from this. One thing I do tell people when they have structural pathology is sometimes that leads to down the line, the stimulation not being as effective as it was initially. And he was very understanding of that and wanted to proceed with this as opposed to going through a more extensive spine surgery. Case number three is a patient that presents with left-sided neck pain and parasthetic type pain in the left arm after a work-related injury. He underwent a C5 to 7 anterior cervical discectomy infusion with little relief of his symptoms. His EMG showed a chronic radiculopathy, but no ongoing denervation. And he underwent a single lead percutaneous spinal cord stimulator trial with about 75% relief of his left arm pain and his neck pain. So again, he underwent some imaging prior to surgery. You can see his previous fusion at C5 to C7. And his MRI actually looked pretty good. We didn't see any evidence of foraminal or central canal stenosis that would really explain his symptoms. So we took him to the operating room and we did this with percutaneous leads. And we placed two leads just off of midline and covering both sides of the spinal cord in the epidural space dorsally. And we were able to get the leads the whole way up to C2. And this gentleman had good relief of his symptoms. He's had about 75 to 80% relief of his neck and arm pain system symptoms. And he's very happy with the results to this point. Getting into some different types of stimulation, case number four is a 61 year old female with a long standing history of abdominal pain. She underwent multiple abdominal surgeries in the past with no significant relief. She underwent bilateral T11 DRG stimulator trials with greater than 50% relief of her symptoms, but a continued area of pain just inferior to where she felt the stimulation. So we took her to the operating room and we placed bilateral T11 leads. And then on the side where she had that non-relief of her pain inferiorly, we, were pla we placed the lead at the T12 foramen. And you can see that these leads are going out the foramen in the region of the dorsal root ganglion. She's had very good relief of her symptoms. Uh, she's got about 60% relief of her chronic abdominal pain. And she's been going for about nine months now with this and has done really well. The last case I have to present is a 35 year old female with a long standing history of chronic posterior headaches. She had a posterior fossa craniotomy for removal of a tumor as a child. She has lancinating pain that radiates over the top of her head and a positive Tonell sign over the greater occipital nerve. She responded positively to occipital nerve blocks in the past. However, she's had diminishing returns of those blocks over time. So we took her to the operating room and we placed two leads in the posterior region of the scalp crossing the location of the occipital nerve. And we did a trial of this and she got about 80% relief of her headaches. We took those leads out in the office and she elected to proceed with permanent implant. We then went back to the operating room a few weeks later and we put new leads in in the same position and hooked her up to a pulse generator under the skin which we placed on the chest wall. She's done very well with this. She's had about 75% relief of her chronic headaches, and she is about two months out from surgery now, and she's been able to work more and have more of her normal life back from these crippling headaches. 
So I'd be happy to take any questions. Again, I'm sorry I'm not there in person. I think this is a really great opportunity for you guys to learn some things about parts of neurosurgery that aren't really taught frequently in medical school. If you have any questions, my email is on the screen and I'm sure the group can get you in touch with me. Thanks again for having me and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. All right. Well, I will um, this up for another me. incredible lecture by Dr. Devanzo. Um, Dr. Devanzo was our last speaker, and so this concludes our weekend webinar on neuromodulation. Um, ben, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I was just going to say I'll leave this up for a minute in case anybody uh, wants to get this down if they want to send him any questions, uh, or they can also put it in the chat and we'll be happy to pass along questions to him as well that way. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming out on a Saturday. Um, special thanks to everyone at the Neurosurgery uh, Training Center. Um, and thanks to you, Ben, for helping organize this. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, thanks again to the Drexel ANS group. Josh, Ben, phenomenal job. Um, and also to all the faculty, um, both who were able to show up live and also Dr. Devanzo as well. Um, and thank you to all the students who were able to show up, you know, for, especially for the duration of like four hours on a Saturday starting at, you know, pre 10 a.m. Um, very impressive. And thank you guys for showing up. Um, all right. And with that, we'll conclude. Hey, everyone. Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.